All right, this is the second part of our uh, lecture on uh, spine emergencies. Let's move on to spinal fractures. So some of the key questions you have to ask are, is this stable or not? What's the neurologic status? Is it an intact neurologic exam? Is there partial injury or is there complete injury? Uh, some of the stuff you will hear also are so-called uh, column models. Sometimes in the cervical spine you'll also hear a two-column model, but very frequently you're going to hear about a three-column model, and definitely in the thoracolumbar spine where you have this sort of anterior column of the anterior half of the disc and vertebral body, middle column, which is the posterior half of that, and then the posterior column, which is everything in the back, facets, lamina, etc. The key really is the middle column, right? And that's what helps distinguish between something that's stable versus unstable, is if you have involvement of the middle column. So um, when we talk about middle column injuries or burst fractures, um, we have to decide, is it something that's stable or unstable? So a burst fracture is considered unstable if any of the following are present associated neurologic deficits, loss of greater than 50% of vertebral body height, greater than 20 degrees of spinal angulation, and compromise more than 50% of the spinal canal. That is like if you have, you'll see an image of this fracture with fragments extruded into the spinal canal pressing the nerve roots. So cervical spine fractures typically occur in trauma patients and they occur because of a failure of bony and ligamentous structures. And you got to remember the cervical spine is the very mobile portion of the spine. You know, the, the thoracic spine to some degree is protected by the rib cage, right? And then the, the junction between the very rigid um, thoracic spine and then mobile lumbar spine is where you also can get injuries at the thoracolumbar junction. And when you get injuries, it can re result in spinal cord injury in the cervical spine or nerve root injury. So when you assess these patients, you're going to check for neck pain, tenderness, all right? It's trauma. So, you know, if you don't have any tenderness at all, neck pain, you have to wonder really, you know, if there's an injury there. Um, again, pain is subjective, but, uh, you know, pretty, pretty common if you can have an acute traumatic fracture. Possible spinous process step off or gap. Um, you can do a thorough neurological examination, motor sensory reflex coordination, etc. You're going to check plane radiographs, and very often we go right to CT imaging if you're really concerned. Um, you can get dynamic flexion extension views in special cases if you're still concerned about an injury with negative x-rays and you need to rule out a ligamentous injury. And then also MRI can help, uh, not as easily done in, in an emergency setting, but this can be done to help assess the spinal cord or rule out ligamentous injury. Now here's something we're not going to go through all of this in detail, just kind of giving you an example of, you know, or multiple examples of the different types of fractures you can see with, with compression type injuries, distraction type injuries, rotational injuries, and just the, com the different combinations and uh, injury mechanisms that can um, create fractures and uh, fracture dislocations in the spine. So management of cervical spine fracture is going to be immobilization in a hard C collar or cervical collar. Stable fractures are often can be treated with immobilization until they heal, whereas unstable fractures typically are um, going to require something more, surgical stabilization, maybe decompression and fusion. So something like this, for instance, where we've gone in and had to stabilize and fuse the spine. So we talked about thoracolumbar fractures. Um, they're treated similarly, and like I said, at the thoracolumbar junction, like T, like L1, for instance, um, it's an it's an area where you transition from a sort of very protected area to a mobile area. So it's a transition zone, and you can get injuries here. For instance, falling from a height, um, you can get an L1 burst fracture, as an example. Uh, lumbar spine fractures can result in nerve root injury or cauda equina syndrome, as we talked about in the first part of this uh, lecture. And here you can see an example of um, an axial image with uh, you get the impression that there's been some um, you know, fragmentation out here. Here you can see this is the typical space you should have 
for the spinal canal. And look what's going on. You got this huge fragment extruded in here. Um, and Cauticoin is supposed to be sitting there, so this could be a problem. Uh, here seen in, on the bottom on a sagittal image. So um, thoracolumbar lumbar spine fractures, you can assess them similar uh, to cervical spine, maintain spinal precautions, uh, and motor vehicle uh, injuries. You also look for so-called lap belt injuries to the torso. Okay, and on imaging, you're gonna um, look for these uh, findings as, as shown here. Management is similar to cervical spine injury. Stable injuries treated non-surgically and braced, whereas unstable injuries can be treated with surgical stabilization, maybe decompression fusion. So here you can see an example going from uh, left to right of, um, you know, here you can see the area of uh, L1, okay, transition zone between the thoracic spine and lumbar spine. Uh, comminuted uh, fractures also involving the, uh, you can see the uh, end plate of L2. Uh, patient uh, in this case uh, was determined to have an unstable fracture, uh, met criteria, let's just say, as we discussed earlier, and undergoes this uh, procedure, right, in which case um, uh, decompression's been done, stabilization, bone grafting, and um, and fusion procedures to, to, for long-standing um, stability. All right, spinal cord injury. Now, when you have a spinal cord injury, um, it can be intact. That is, you don't have a spinal cord injury, right? I mean, on the, scheme of, on the scheme of things, you can start with being intact, or you have a partial spinal cord injury, or you have a complete spinal cord injury at a certain level, right? Um, so we other specifics we talk about are you know, where it is cervical or C6 level or partial injury. Um, partial injuries include uh, the these four uh, this described below, and we'll go through this. Treatment strategies: Well, if the patient's intact, try to keep them intact. Um, so a patient has a fracture or trauma and. Uh, it's unstable injury, but no obvious cord injury. Well, you do everything you can to preserve that. If they have a complete spinal cord injury, well, then the best you can do is stabilize them. And if you have a partial spinal cord injury, you've got a little bit of a opportunity here, and you can reduce the fracture, decompress the cord or cauda equina, and stabilize them. So complete spinal cord injury, by definition, is absence of sensory and motor function in the lowest sacral segment after resolution of spinal shock, whereas an incomplete injury like your cord syndrome, central cord syndrome, these are indicated by the presence of sensory and motor function to some degree in the lowest sacral segment. So some preserved function below that neurologic level of injury. This is an axial showing the, um, there's a typo here, this should say dorsal, but this is showing your, um, your um, nerve tracts in the spinal cord, right? So you have your I'm not going to go through all of them, but you have your sensory and your motor tracts in different areas of the spinal cord. Um, depending on where your insult is, you're going to get a different type of incomplete spinal cord injury, right? So here you can see the shaded area, you know, in the center here. This is a central cord syndrome. So this happens in elderly patients with um, injuries who had pre-existing spondylosis, for instance. <coughs> They have a predilection to upper extremity motor loss. Okay, and these patients can actually do okay with treatment. Brown Sicard is a it's a uncommon but um, interesting lesion in which you have sort of this um, sort of hemi injury of the spinal cord. Uh, it can happen from penetrating injury, for instance, and you get sort of this um, ipsilateral motor uh, and some sensory loss, and then you get contralateral pain and temperature loss because of the nerve tracts that cross over. So, you know, you have the um, you know, nerve tracts come over and cross this way. Uh, so you get this sort of like different uh, symptoms on either side of the body. Interesting uh, injury, uh, good prognosis for ambulation. Anterior cord syndrome, um, you don't do quite as well. A uh, lot of motor loss, uh, vibration and position sense is spared, but how far is that going to get you? 
happens from flexion injury, poor prognosis for recovery. And posterior cord stains we really don't see a lot of. Uh, profound sensory loss, uh, pain and temperature is less affected, motor uh, tracts are largely spared. All right, so last little topic we're going to just talk about in terms of spine emergencies or infections. So they can be a high acuity situation um, in which something needs to be done. Um, they are uh, things that happen in immunocompromised patients. They often have constitutional signs and symptoms, fevers, chills, myalgias, weight loss, etc. Uh, atypical mechanical features. Um, sometimes if you're not sure what's going on, and a CRP or ESR, blood tests can sometimes tip you off that there may be an infection happening. Uh, not everybody's walking around in you know, a big obvious abscess or draining pus. Um, the uh, principles of treatment are decompression, debridement, get specimens, diagnose what the bug is. Oftentimes these are staph aureus, but not always. IVDA or intravenous drug uh, abuse uh, patients may have gram negative organisms. Um, the frequent, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, treatment is frequently uh, operative with uh, surgical drainage. Um, consider non operative treatment if the patient's a poor surgical candidate. The abscess involves a considerable length. Um, a uh, patient has uh, no obvious deficit or is uh, complete greater than 72 hours. Here you see uh, an example of actually severe infection here on the left um, at the lumbar spine level. And here you, uh, in, in this example, uh, compressing the cauda. And here you can see actual example of a um, uh, epidural abscess here causing compression of the spinal cord at the, uh, it looks like in this case, in, in, in at the level of the thoracic spine. So in many cases, these have to be decompressed. Uh, before we had antibiotics, these patients would do very poorly. Um, if they come in with greater than 36 to 48 hours of paralysis, it's a poor prognosis. They have complete sensory loss, it's a poor prognosis. And if you get to them very late, uh, they may not recover well. So to summarize, caught equina syndrome, keyword saddle anesthesia, urinary retention, sciatica, urgent surgical decompression, right? Fractures, you have to think about concepts of stability, neurologic integrity, and when you have lesions leading to partial cord or caught equina syndromes, treatment might be urgent. And with infections, sometimes they're not so easy to pick up on. So recognition is important, and then urgent decompression in the face of neurologic deficits. All right, that was it. Shorter lecture than the um, first spine lecture, and uh, that's all for spine. Thanks.